All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started so I can, uh, we can respect your time and uh, make sure you're out of here by 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, welcome to the second uh, community conversation. We have a series of six of them. You don't have to come to every one. You can only come to one if you'd like. Uh, you're welcome to come to as many as you'd like. Uh, around the topic of magnet schools and the idea of how can we provide choice uh, to parents uh, as part of the Cedar Rapids School District. Uh, my name is Trace Pickering. I'm the Associate Superintendent here. And uh, we're going to go through an acti uh, activities tonight that are highly engaging and that really get you involved. I think you probably were cued into that with the big paper and markers at your table. Um, and we're also uh, honored tonight to have the incoming president of Magnet Schools of America with us, Doreen Marvin, and she's right there waving at us. I've known Doreen for a decade or so. We've done lots of work together. She's working with our Sina schools uh, as part of that work. And um, it just so happened that she was also president of the Magnet School. So I'm like, perfect. Well, let's have a community conversation when she was here working with our Sina schools. And so um, this, this evening, you'll have an opportunity to interact with her and to ask questions and uh, things, that, things along that nature. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Why are we here tonight? All right, well, we're here for several reasons, I, I think. The first is we have an interest in our children, their education, and their future. Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking time out of your schedule to be here. We all desire a vibrant child and family-friendly community. We come together as citizens interested in transforming education in order to create a better life for our children and a better future for our children. So as such, transformation, which is the creation of something new and better, uh, occurs not by, not by mandate, but only choice. You can't mandate transformational kinds of things. You can only do it through choice. And so we come together to co-create and think about what can, we, uh, what can we do to offer our children and our parents choice in this community uh, towards a brighter future. And as I mentioned, this is going to be high participation, high engagement. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time talking up here. We're going to put you to work here pretty quickly. So how I'd like you to start is you, on each side of the table, the, where there are six, you have groups of three. If you're at a table of four, four is OK. Uh, but in groups of three, I would like you to spend a few minutes around these questions with the colleagues that you're sitting with there. Introduce yourself and answer three questions as a triad. Why is it important for you to be here tonight? You have lots of things to do. You're very busy people. Why did you come here tonight? Why did you choose that? Number two, what sacrifice are you making to be here? Right? We all have sacrifices we made to make sure we were here. What was yours? And number three, what gift are you bringing to us tonight to, to be a part of this conversation? I right? can give you six, seven minutes, only in groups of three, please, except for table four, uh, to answer these questions, get to know each other. Questions? Go. All right, thank you. I just want to give you an opportunity to get to know the folks at your table and the sacrifices they, they're making tonight to be here and the gifts that they're bringing to this conversation. I'm going to give you just a, about 10 minutes of just a preview of magnet schools, uh, why we're thinking about this, why we're engaging the community before we, um, we turn the, the markers over to you. So magnet schools, what are they and what are they not? Uh, you have at your table uh, some FAQs that we've been putting together. Uh, last week we generated more questions. We're in the process of getting uh, some responses to those as well. So on engagecrschools.com, we'll keep updating this file uh, so you can see that. But I would encourage you to conduct your own research. Uh, we'll, we're going to share research that we found from the six major studies on magnet schools, but we would encourage you to do your own research. Uh, always remember, however, it's very important to know the source of the research. Um, is it peer-reviewed? Has it gone through all those kinds of things, or is it coming from some think tank that either is for them or against them? And there are both. Uh, so just be careful with, uh, with the research you look at. 
we have some assumptions about why magnets might be a good choice for our community, what they are, and so forth. So we're going to share those with you. Uh, assumptions are meant to be challenged. They're meant to be added to, taken away from, so forth. This is just our starting point. It's what we uh, are currently thinking about. The first is parent and student choice is an important element in a successful school experience. The research is pretty clear on this. Uh, so how do we give parents and children as much choice as possible? Second, strong public schools are in the public's best interest and in the public good, and they're a key to a strong democracy, and this community cares about public education. So those two together tell us how do we provide choice inside the existing school system and make that work. Magnet schools are one possibility it's not the answer, it's a answer, an answer, right? So this is just one of many uh, possibilities, but as we've looked at it, this seemed to be the, the one to bring forward for some conversation. Community support for the magnet, the theme of the magnet um, is critical for a magnet success. And we can't have a marine biology magnet school in Cedar Rapids because we have no industry or any kind of expertise that supports that theme, right? So the theme has to match the identity of its community. So that's an important piece. Our current assumption at this point is magnet schools offer the greatest potential for results of all the choice options out there. And again, as we comb through the research, magnet school research outshines charter schools, voucher programs, um, you know, special charters and private schools and online schools, magnets consistently outperform all of those other choices. We believe it's our moral imperative to ensure that every child in this community is college, career, and community ready when they exit our system, every child. And we believe that collectively, we have the experience, the expertise, and the commitment and knowledge in, in this community to make things like this happen, to give parents and kids more choice and to lead the state and the nation in the way we treat our children and the way we prepare them for their future. Those are our current assumptions uh, today. We're constantly challenging them, uh, looking for other ones and, and so forth moving forward. Magnet School Research, I'm gonna just hit on a few. Uh, Doreen is here uh, later. She will go into more depth with some of this because. She's uh, forgotten more about it than I know at this point. But again, as we looked at the research, there were six major studies, uh, peer-reviewed studies that have been done on magnet schools over the last couple of decades. The data I'm showing you is a compilation of the findings from those six major studies. Magnets have been associated with increased student achievement, higher levels of student motivation and satisfaction in their schooling, higher levels of teacher motivation and morale, and higher levels of parent satisfaction in their children's education. They're more effective than charters, traditional public schools, parochial, and secular private schools in reading and social studies, consistently outperform all of those in those two areas. Magnets tend to strengthen the diversity of the community, not weaken it, and magnets become reflections of their community in, the, in terms of its diversity. There's some emerging research that suggests charter schools might do the opposite of that. Magnet students are less likely to skip or be absent. Students in magnet schools graduate at higher rates. Magnets are effective at retaining households and families in the community. And two and a half million children today attend magnet schools uh, in the United States, this is twice the enrollment size of all the charters combined. And again, when Doreen has an opportunity to speak to you, she has personally helped start eight of them, from laying the bricks all the way to the school. She didn't really lay the bricks, but did the planning for that. So what's our current thinking about magnet schools? Again, we think the theme has to reflect the values of the community or it's just not gonna fly. If a lottery process is needed, it has to be fair and equitable and can't create more separation and less diversity. 
right? The magnet must be in relative proximity to the work being done in the community. So for example, if we said, let's have a medical sciences magnet, it makes sense that that school exists somewhere near the two regional hospitals in our community and the colleges that are, have strong nursing programs in that. Okay, so you wouldn't want to put the school so far away from that center of activity that it makes it difficult to access those kinds of things. Not only do parents and children need choice, staff need choice. Teachers and staff must also be able to choose whether they teach in a theme magnet or they don't. And they should be honored for any choice they make one way or the other. The community, in addition to the district, has to commit to doing this. We can't do this alone as a school district. We need our community support, not only just financially, but expertise. We have to tap into the expertise and, and expose our children to the, the experts in the community that can help enrich their learning. Magnets must not bleed resources from the other schools. If we spend all this on magnets, at the detriment of our neighborhood schools, we're defeating the very purpose that we're after. So we don't want to do that. Some logistical stuff, the building has to have enough space to accommodate kids. We are committed to the neighborhood school idea. We're not talking at this point about uh, taking a school and making it uh, completely a magnet where the neighborhood kids can't go there. We are looking at a magnet that is a, a hybrid. So if it sits in a neighborhood, every child in that neighborhood can choose to attend that school and they'll get in. Extra space then would be open to parents from outside that school boundary to say, I want my child to go here as well. So there's, uh, that's where our thinking is at this point as well. And finally, our preference is to start at the elementary school. Simply size and complexity, a little easier to deal with at the elementary. But if our community comes forward and says, nope, we want middle school, nope, we want to start at high school, then we're going to work on that because right, it's what our community wants. But our thinking now, elementary seem to make the most sense. So we went out in the community and we said, well, what are some themes that could help the community get started on the conversation? And we came up with these starter themes. They're not the themes, they're not the only ones, but there are four that we decided, let's throw these out there at least to get people thinking. The first, I already mentioned, a medical sciences STEM. Why that? We have two strong regional hospitals. We have Kirkwood and Mount Mercy with strong nursing and health science uh, curriculums. And Coe College has a renowned science department as well. Seems to be a community strength of ours. Seems to be part of our identity. That made some sense. In addition to that, STEM is a big deal everywhere. If you haven't heard of STEM, you haven't been reading or being, spent much time on the internet. Um, but we want to make sure that our, our female students, our girls, stay in STEM fields. Right? We lose too many girls by the time they get to middle school and high school. And again, the research tends to indicate when the STEM is connected to fields in which, people, which, which we help people and make a better world, girls are retained longer. So medical sciences made sense for that reason as well. Visual and performing arts. We already have Johnson School for the Arts that years ago operated somewhat like a magnet. It's not a magnet today, but it still has that culture and pride around being the School of the Arts. Uh, we have a strong and vibrant arts and culture community. That made sense. Museum and history. Again, we have many quality museums in this community. We have a rich tradition in history. Uh, it made sense there as well to connect to that uh, strength. And finally, in the last couple of years, we have become the creative corridor. And we are becoming known in the state as the place to come if you want to start a new business and be an entrepreneur. We have lots of work going on down in Newbo and downtown to support that kind of work. Uh, if you've noticed in the Gazette the last few weeks, they have that section we create here. That whole focus is on how do you develop that economy and support entrepreneurs. It would make some sense, perhaps, to think about a school in that regard. So those are our four. They're not exclusive. There's other ident identifiers in our community. There's just a place to start. Some inaccurate assumptions and rumors that we've heard. This is always the fun part for me. <clears throat> 
Here's what we've heard thus far. The board's already decided uh, to do magnets and which ones they're going to support. False. Um, when I've, I've only been with the district a few months, when I first got here, um, Dave and Director Meisterling said, hey, how do we get choice going and get the conversation started? We're intrigued by the idea of magnets. That's why we're here today. It has nothing to do with any board action or, or so forth. We can't afford magnets. Why are we even talking about this? Right? We didn't pass PEPL. We've had to close schools. It's ridiculous to even spend time talking about this. My only comment back to that is we can never stop thinking about what's best for our children because we can't afford it today. If our community really, really wants something, the money in that flows with it. We'll find a way. And so we don't want to think, we don't want to restrict our thinking too soon on this. Can we afford it today? Maybe not. Is it what we want to aspire to? Perhaps, and we'll figure it out. This means other schools wouldn't have programs like art or STEM. False. Uh, some, we had some folks think, well, so if we have an art magnet, that means all the other art teachers in the district lose their job and there's no art programs in those pro No. A magnet is simply a theme that the curriculum wraps around and it's a focal point. It doesn't mean that all the other schools get starved of it. If art's important for one group of kids, it's important for all the kids. The application process would be set up so the lottery would ensure that only the best got in. There are some charters and some magnets that have operated in this way. That's not our belief structure. We believe that it has to be an equitable, fair way of getting, uh, letting families and that get in. The magnets do not have to achieve the same results as the other schools. That's false. They would be a public school under the same mandates and regulations that all the other schools are under. And the last one, this process is simply a ruse to say that you are involved. We're going to do what we want anyway. Um, I'm just speaking for myself. If I knew what we were going to do anyway, I wouldn't waste your time or mine, right? Because I'm making sacrifices to be here too, right? This has to be supported by the community. It has to be something our community says they want to pursue. Okay. Enough on that. You're going to have opportunities to ask Doreen uh, questions at the end. She'll be floating around here in a little bit, uh, visiting with you as well. But we want to get you involved, right? We can make magnets whatever we want them to be, or any kind of parent choice that we want to make, if we just decide to do it as a community. You're the community here tonight willing to take this on. So we're going to give you an extended period of time, probably a good uh, 20 minutes on this one and 20 on another. You have a table of six. You have at least six markers at your table. You have a big sheet of paper. You are not to assign a recorder. You are all recorders. So you grab a marker and you start a conversation and you draw and scribble and make diagrams and create pictures and whatever you want to do around these four questions. What sorts of experiences and learning environments must we create for our kids? What are the possibilities in front of us as we choose to think about this idea of a magnet kind of school? How would you design a magnet if we were to put one in place? How would you make it work? And what themes would you like to see? What themes excite you and you think connect to our community? You don't have to do these questions in order. You can float around however you'd like around the questions, but your table of six, have a conversation and write and draw your ideas because we are going to take these, transcribe them, and make a public record of the ideas and, and thinking that's coming out of these meetings. Lots of instructions and questions in a short amount of time. Any clarifying questions that you have for me? Okay, go to it. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. A couple of quick things I want to I want to say so I don't forget them later and you wonder. I'll try to restate them again at the end. Um, typically, these community conversations, the next phase is a gallery walk, and you have a chance to see what other other folks had to say and uh, have a conversation. We're not going to do that at this session because I want to give. Uh, give Doreen some time to share with you her experiences with magnet schools and give you an opportunity to ask 
uh, ask some questions of her. What we will do with these sheets of paper like we did last week is we will have them all transcribed. We're going to take photos of each one, put it on the website so the actual product will be there. And we're going to take uh, all the information, get it down in, in uh, printed format, get all the questions, record the questions, do our best to answer them as best we can and so forth. So we have a community collection of these over time. So um, they're not going anywhere and your, uh, your thoughts and ideas will be added to the to the whole mix so but what I want to do with the last half hour that we have together is give uh, Doreen a chance to uh, share with you her story about magnet schools she has like I mentioned personally started eight of them been involved with eight of them Connecticut is a big magnet school state uh, they've done a lot of work and provided some legislation I think Doreen to help help all that along mm -hmm. um, so she's gonna make a few opening comments and then we'll open it up for questions so please welcome Doreen Marvin Well, thank you. You all are so sweet in the Midwest. You know, I grew up in New York City. I can be kind of tough, so it's nice to be around. Um, you know, the Midwest. It's just nice. Uh, I actually am familiar with Cedar Rapids in that I work for an educational service agency, which is just like your Grant Wood AEA. Uh, and Trace and I know each other from uh, his Grant Wood days and some work that I've done over there. So. Uh, I think I've been coming to Cedar Rapids for about 20 years or so and um, working here in the district right now with some of your sinus schools, which is really exciting work also. My role at the Educational Service Center in Connecticut is as the Director of Development, which is really about all our new programs and new initiatives, which includes magnet schools. And so we have literally transformed and built schools from the ground up, eight of them. We have um, a pre-K K school whose focus is literacy and friendship, and it's called the Friendship School. There are 520 three, four, and five-year-olds together. We have the oldest magnet school in Connecticut, the Regional Multicultural Magnet School, which has 545 K through fifth graders, it was the first school in the country to draw from 12 communities. Now that's pretty common practice. We also have a middle school that's focused on dual language and arts, Bilingue de Artes. And that's a very small school for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And it is like the sweetest little school around. And students learn in Spanish and English and um, through the arts also. They actually will be adding a technology component soon and be really focusing on graphic arts, and they're going to add Chinese and Russian as part of their language studies. Then another school that actually makes me have to color my hair more often, um, it took us 12 years to actually get a marine science magnet school built. Uh, one would think that a marine science school would make sense to be next to the water, yes? Not in Connecticut. Because you know there's that thing, the 500-year flood? Yeah, so we had property that was 50 feet in the floodplain, and we spent like two years trying to figure out things. But the Department of Environmental Protection had never heard that school systems actually had snow days, and we knew how to close school, and we know how to get kids out and things like that. So that was a challenge, but that's been open now for three years. Um, it's a very, very exciting school. We also have the Connecticut River Academy, which is an environmental school, and that's an early college model also. So it's on a college campus, and students start taking college courses in 10th grade, and based on whatever their motivation level is, they actually um, graduate, can, be, can enter Goodwin College straight from the uh, high school with probably a good two to two and a half years worth of credits um, as they go in, so that's a big savings. And then we also have a middle college, which is only for 11th and 12th graders, and that's on the community college campus. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be focused on three strands that the college was really trying to grab from an economic driver standpoint. Um, but funny, you know, not all kids want to do finance or engineering. Some actually want to do early childhood and some other things. So that broadened our horizons, uh, and the students are there. We have another early childhood 
magnet school that's a Reggio Emilia. We have not yet gotten to go to Italy though. So we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to hope that we can get there. Um, and some of those are in typical school buildings that were just, trans we just transformed the curriculum into the theme-based learning and the magnet component and others are brand new construction. In Connecticut, we have 83 magnet schools. There are about 5,000 magnet schools across the country. Um, Trace had said that I'm the incoming president, which will become official in May, uh, for Magnet Schools of America. So you are in good company with other communities that either explore and say this isn't for us, or they explore and they say this is great and they jump right in, or they say let's dabble just a little bit and let's try one or two to get started. Um, and there's plenty of resources and lots of places you could go and visit. I actually just spent last week at a technical assistance conference on magnet schools and some of your friends from Sioux City were there. I also understand that Iowa, Iowa City is also thinking about this too. Uh, magnet schools actually started back in the 60s. This is not a new concept. They've been around for a long time. Uh, they are well grounded not only in um, desegregation and cultural diversity and the celebration of diversity, but also well grounded in instructional practices, really about project-based learning, um, engaging kids in a theme. It does not necessarily mean that all those students that are at that marine science high school are going to be marine scientists. Does it not mean that at all? Some of them just want to go to the Coast Guard Academy and they think that that's going to give them a good leg up. Some of them want to be doctors. Others just are really like, I said this, this, I think it was this table, they're just science geeks, you know, and they really like that. Um, we also have a science technology um, magnet high school, which is part of another school. So that's a program within a school, not a whole school. So you can tell there's lots of models and opportunities out there. In Connecticut, we've got aerospace. We also have public service and leadership. We have another um, school that focuses on sports and medical sciences. So lots of different choices and opportunities. Montessori, International Baccalaureate. Questions? Question for Green, just raise your hand. So I saw some questions on the papers before. One was, how do kids get into magnet schools? Well, I'll talk about best practice, okay? And what really would pass muster with the, Feder with the Office of Civil Rights. Open lotteries. No entrance criteria, no tests. You're interested, you fill out a paper, your name goes into a hat. Some places still do them literally in a hat or a cup, <laughs> but they do have random uh, generators, uh, software to be able to do that. So those, that's best practice. You may find in places like Houston, Houston Independent School District, that they have vanguard schools that they consider magnet schools. And those are um, for gifted and talented students. Doreen's opinion, all kids have different gifts and different talents and to be able to spread the wealth of that around um, a school district would be my preference. Uh, it doesn't say that those kids are not fabulous and those schools are very, very successful also. Um, but those are choices that each community has to make. How do we want to recruit students for these schools? How do we want to let the community know that these are opportunities and that they are choices for families? How do you make sure that families across all the strata of the, of the city um, know about it and can fill out an application if it's something that they want to choose to do. Yes. Yes. What's the governance structure look like and how does that tie to those uh, community-based supports? Mm -hmm. To be clear, magnet schools are still part of the, in this case, Cedar Rapids Community Schools. 
They are not separate entities. They are part of the Board of Education. Unlike charter schools, which have their own separate governance structure and are typically separated from the, in this case, the Cedar Rapids uh, community schools. Partnerships are an essential part of magnet schools, those community partnerships. What a magnet school allows you to do with a community partner is to be really strategic about it. So to go, be able to go out and find a community partner that has a vested interest in the theme in which you are doing allows you to have mutual benefit. Right? So you're able to, in some cases, what you're doing is you're building a pathway to that community partner, maybe if it's a business, instead of everybody wanting to come and partner with your school, Vanessa. I don't know if you're a teacher or anything, so please. Okay, I'm just going to pick on Vanessa. So if Vanessa is a principal at a school and she gets bombarded with 100 different community partners, it's difficult to say no. Yes? People agree? All right. This way, you're able to be really strategic about your partnerships, and then you could say, you know what? Our theme here is the arts. However, Gary School is about sciences, and you might be better off partnering there. Um, many times what a magnet school will have is an advisory committee that's focused on the theme for the school, and that would include parents as well as community members. Um, but they are not necessarily a governing structure. They're really an advisory piece. What, uh, what distinguishes successful magnets from unsuccessful ones in terms of startup? What has to happen once the decision's made and the lottery stuff's figured out? What has to happen at that school with those teachers, mm -hmm. with the parents, to make yeah. it successful? We have a 16-page document that helps you do like this little checkoff sheet sort of like when you go to fly an airplane, all the pilots, they have checklists. We got a 16-page one for you. Uh, the first piece is really about understanding what it means to scream your theme. And I'm stealing that um, title from a colleague of mine out of Massachusetts. You need to, when you walk in that school, you need to be able to feel what the theme is. So that really distinguishes a successful magnet school. Are you fully integrating the theme throughout all the lessons? What you would hope is, is I'll use the word dosage. You would hope that students are getting about 90% of their learning in that theme, that there be a dosage of, of that high. Now, it takes you about three years to get there, and it's not always pretty the first few months, right? Folks are trying out some new things. You're trying to integrate curriculum. You may or may not have all of the right materials and you know the optimal materials that you'd want to have in your school to start with. But boy, oh boy, do you get a lot of creativity that's going on. Um, so I would say that that would be key number one. Scream your theme when you get started. The next piece is, is to really make sure that the folks that you have advising and being part of the school, that you're really engaging parents as part of that. And then the third one would be to not be afraid to ask for help. Yes? I have to ask this question as a legislator. Um, the equity part. Mm -hmm. So in order to be a magnet or the theme to attract people to it, it's got to be really good. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to make sure that you don't have all the resources and talent going to just these magnet schools. You want to make sure that all the schools have that. So how does a system, how does the system work to do that, to make sure that, that it isn't just a lottery? You know, in terms of a lottery, I think of a lottery that there's winners, just a few winners, and the others don't. And so those that don't get the lottery, how do those parents and those kids mm -hmm. feel afterwards if they didn't get their choice and so mm -hmm. on? So, I mean that perception, how do you deal with that with magnet schools, that perception? Um, for, most, for many communities, it starts with being able to say that your neighborhood school, I'll use that term here, your attendance zone school, is a really good choice also, right? That that is as high quality of a choice as anything else. Uh, and that not all children want or will be, if you have an uh, 
K to five school that's focused on science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, um, which is you know the big buzzword, um, oftentimes. That not everybody not everybody fits into that, um, and that parents really look at who are their child, what is it that their interests are, move them. But it, it's intriguing to me. So I'm going to use this example: New London um, Public Schools in Connecticut when their science and technology magnet high school was opening up, everybody said, oh, nobody will go there. Nobody will go there. I will tell you that they have no trouble. And do you know what happened? That magnet program piece that's in there, it drove the high school of which those kids cross over. It drove them to actually be better than they were. Uh, so, the important piece is, is that all the choices in Cedar Rapids community schools are of high quality. Um, and you will drive a little bit. I will tell you that the first two years of schools, what typically happens is, is there is this sense of competition. And then that sort of fades away. And then it's really about what's the best choice for my child or any child. Yes. So So would you say then that uh, the children who don't win the lottery will have the same opportunities as the ones who did that go to the magnet school, assuming they have the same interests? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Well, uh, will they, I mean, for example, you mentioned a Russian and Chinese in addition mm -hmm. to, so uh, will kids who aren't in that magnet school, do they have the same opportunities to learn those things if that's their interest? Or if they have a marine biology interest, can they do that in their ordinary public school, mm -hmm. or, uh, or are they just, I mean, I'm not sure, I don't know who you are. Oh, Art, okay, all right. Um, I don't get the Gazette anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the kids who aren't the winners in the lottery. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he said uh, there's a perception that there are winners and losers. I would say it's more than a perception. I'd say it's a reality. And uh, do those kids who don't get into the school, which we're all talking about building because we're assuming it's going to be a better way of educating kids, those kids who aren't in that school, will they have the same opportunities, the same uh, uh, chance to have uh, a uh, excellent uh, education that's gonna meet all of their needs that we're building this magnet school to attempt to do? It may not be in a theme-based way, but those are certainly decisions that the district has to make about how the other schools that are not in a theme-based manner, how they operate, are not in a magnet. It really, it's a, it's a district decision as to how, how instruction happens at non-magnet schools. The interesting thing about magnet schools is it's not only the theme-based piece, but it's about drawing from all over a community or communities, as the case may be. Uh, I would say that communities where you have magnets, you have all different kinds of choice. You have a portfolio of choice uh, within the district that um, there will always be kids who may not get into a lottery. If you do a really good job, and there's high demand, what that says to the school district is, hmm, maybe we need to think about this particular theme and the demand, and is there another place within the district where we could replicate this program? It's really about strategizing that out over a period of time. Yes. Here. You can talk to my chest. Um, I'm more comfortable with my Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get that personal. Um, there was a documentary that came out called The Lottery um, that we've seen, my kids have seen, and it addresses that specific issue. And if you watch it, it's heart-wrenching, the kids that don't get in. How do you respond to that? I mean, mm -hmm. are we looking at the potential for that to happen here? Because I see the good and what could come of this, but I worry about those kids that don't get in. And is it going to be that heart-wrenching crying on your mom's shoulder as you leave because mm -hmm. you don't get into that school because the rest of the public schools are just mediocre? Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I, I worry about that becoming sure. what happens here. Sure. Um, the first thing I would say is I'm not going to comment on whether or not the other schools um, are mediocre or not. I have no way of, of judging that. What I would say is that 
the school district needs to do a really good job of saying what the benefits and what the, um, what the strengths are of the entire district and each school individually then. Uh, yeah, sometimes there are tiers. And again, that's data for the school district to collect to say, you know what, this, oh, well, we thought four might be enough or we thought three might be enough. There's enough demand here that we need to think about where else could we replicate this program. Um, in, I'll, I, Houston is not necessarily a good a comparison to Cedar Rapids just by pure size. Um, you know, they've got 200,000 students. However, what they were able to do uh, through an assessment was look at the number of schools that they had, which ones were magnets, and then which of the neighborhood schools really wanted to do uh, a theme-based type of teaching, and what might the theme for that neighborhood or attendance zone school be, and they shifted some of those in that way. And it really began to balance out um, what their interest and demand was for some of the magnets. It takes a little bit of time to do that, but. Doreen, you mentioned happen. real quick, um, <clears throat> you've mentioned uh, community has to deal with the lottery system and work mm -hmm. its way through that, and then this whole competition thing. What are some other pitfalls or issues that a community has to wrestle with as, as magnet schools get implemented? Um, oftentimes you'll see a shifting of children with identified needs into a school, so they may get into a lottery in another school, so you may have to shift some of your special education resources a little bit differently. Another challenge might be transportation and what would the policy or practice around transportation be for these schools. Um, another one would be the types of recruitment strategies so that you don't necessarily pit one school against another. So to be able to do that in a collaborative manner is important. And I think a, a big one is about the strength of the school system as a whole um, and being able to remind the communities of that. Kathleen? Well, as you were talking about the lottery, as we were talking about that, I guess I hadn't thought maybe far enough. So how does that work in schools if they do an open lottery as you suggested? So our current students that would be interested would put their name into the proverbial hat. Mm -hmm. What about, do they have, they have school districts that have done this? Then you said communities, and then I began to think open enrollment, and then I was like, huh, it didn't go there in my head. Do you see, would see, in your experience, have school districts prioritize mm -hmm. their current students over or, or, or not? Because we know those students come with dollars attached to. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, what, what have you seen school districts sort of do or be successful with that regard? Yes to all of it. It really depends on the community. So you need to make some decisions. So right now, um, I'll use Connecticut again as an example. Norwich Public Schools is transforming two of its elementary schools into magnets, um, mostly because um, they really need to equalize populations across the community. And also, there's a really strong interest um, and has been a, since part of their, uh, they did a design, a new design for themselves uh, three years ago now. And they are looking at, there's, there's really two ways that the Supreme Court would approve you to do this, okay? One is that you set up ahead of time that there's a neighborhood preference or an attendance zone preference, which would include those children that are already there. And some of those families, you would be surprised, will opt out and want to go someplace else. Uh, so you do that in the lottery. All of those children would go in and then there'd be a preference. The other thing you could do is you could say, over the next four years, we're going to transform into a magnet school. And through attrition, we'll accept students from, some place, from another um, area. My understanding is, is that folks in Iowa could choose to go to a school district that's not in the community in which they live. Am I correct in that understanding? And so you may set aside a specific number of seats for a community, um, for students who, for whom they don't reside in Cedar Rapids, but maybe they reside in college community. There you go. Um, and you may say, well, in this school we want to have 
20% of our population from outside of Cedar Rapids. But those are all real community-based decisions. Um, the things that you cannot do is to say that we're going to pick children out of the lottery by race. That's completely not allowable. You have to really narrowly tailor um, from uh, the Supreme Court's perspective on that. You have a question here and then here, Trace. What about the special education students? Do you, do you have programs in Connecticut where they, the special ed students are uh, integrated into the magnet schools? Um, least restrictive environment says that they have to be. Um, there are some children who may go to a school and then their um, planning and placement team may say that you need additional supports for that student or they may say that in the end it's not really the right environment but you cannot eliminate the child or exclude them just because they have an identified need. Okay, so talk to me about what makes you a believer okay, in magnet schools okay. and what has compelled you to lead the work. Mm. You know, I so strongly believe that um, equity is important. Somebody used equity before, right? Um, and equity not just from a resource perspective, but also that all kids should have opportunities to give them the best chance at what it is that they need to do. I also really believe that the more students are exposed to people who are similar and different from them, the better our world will be. Uh, the whole desegregation and, and racial um, piece is such a fabric of our whole of all of the United States that that's important. When I walk around the schools that I've been to here, you have such a, um, a diverse community already. To not capitalize on that, to me, would be um, sad. I've also seen, um, I was telling a story to somebody before, our regional multicultural magnet school, 23 years, they'll celebrate 24 years next year. Um, really, really, it's a special, special place for kids over time. Their first year that they opened, they had over 9,000 parent volunteer hours. And guess what? They've kept steady at that 23 years later, okay? Um, but when kids come out of there, they actually go to a middle school. Because in Connecticut, um, most of our magnets are inter-district. Um, we've got We've got segregation from an urban to a suburban look. There's plenty of studies, the two Connecticut's. We're under court order, too, so. Um, but the piece is that those kids, when they leave, they go back to their hometown, which could be an hour away, okay? So these families choose to drive their kids an hour to go to this school, okay? From East Haddam down there. They leave and they go to the East Haddam Middle School, and guess what? They get in trouble. You know why? Because they actually raise their hand and they question. They raise their hand and they say to a, uh, to a teacher, well, why couldn't you do it this way? Right? So there's this whole element of kids being so engaged that they really learn. And the most important thing is everybody gets invited to everybody else's birthday parties. <laughs> you know? Um, when you have high school students who are on Facebook, there's 50 of them at night trying to solve one chemistry problem together. They're not cheating. They're actually working together. And when you have another student who says, hey, you know, today I was hearing some complaints about how much work we have to do. Hey, get real kids. This is what this school is about, and you need to be engaged. So stop complaining and just get your work done. Like there's that kind of stuff. It just, it really compels me to, to do it. My children, um, they're old <laughs> and didn't have the opportunities to go to the magnet schools, but we lived in an urban setting in Connecticut. And when my daughter, um, who's almost 26, uh, is in med school, 
For us, it was important that, we, that she went to the local public school that was really, really diverse. When she left and went to high school, 2,500 student high school, and she went to go look at colleges, she kept saying, no, mom, that college is like too white. I can't go there. I really need to have people around me that um, fulfill the parts of me that I know are not my strengths, regardless of what their background is. So that's a sort of a long answer that doesn't necessarily flow, but those are all lots of reasons for it. Right, we're about out of time, so let's thank Doreen for her time. And I can't speak for her, uh, but um, I'll be around after 8 o'clock, and I'll stay as long as you'd like if you have questions or uh, want to have a conversation. Um, here's what I need you to do is put your original uh, possibilities paper on top of your questions, one, and you can leave everything at the table. We will get these collected. If, this is not a requirement, if you would like to put your name on the paper, that would be great because if we ever have any clarifying questions in that, we know who to contact, but you don't have to do that. It can stay anonymous. Finally, the last thing we'd like you to do is on your, on your sheet of paper is put a Y, an NS, or an N. A Y means yes, magnets are something we should continue to pursue in our community. An NS means not sure need more information, and an N is nope, this isn't for our community, just anywhere on that sheet big enough so that I can find it later, okay? And finally, a heartfelt thank you. We know how busy you are. We know uh, the commitment you had to make to spend 90 minutes with us. We sincerely appreciate all the comments. We have four more meetings, a minimum of four more coming up here before the winter holiday. Uh, encourage your friends and neighbors and uh, others to, uh, to join join this conversation. I believe next week we're at the IBW Hall on Wednesday night. But on uh, engagecrschools.com, the information is there. You can follow us on Twitter as well, uh, hashtag CRMagnet. Again, thank you very much. We'll stick around and answer questions if you have them. Have a great evening. Um, if folks, uh, one last thing, I would encourage you to go to www.magnet.edu. Um, you will see a lot of resources there from Magnet Schools of America, uh, research, articles, schools that are highlighted. That would be one resource. Um, Trace knows how to get a hold of me if you have any questions. And then if you'd like to see a school in action, I would suggest that you go to www.marinesciencemagnet.org and click on their lip dubs. They've got three lip dubs that they do as part of their recruitment. Um, and it will show you the school in action, really. Okay? On this sheet of paper inside are the, is the schedule text.